Hello, Maxime. Hi. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing coffee with me and uh, having a little talk about uh, Kubernetes. Big topic. Yeah, uh, I have a couple of questions about that. And uh, the first one for me is uh, Kubernetes is hype, okay? Mm -hmm. But is it just hype? No, definitely not. I, I would say that more than a hype, it's actually a trend. Okay. Uh, actually, the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation did a survey last year, and um, uh, we saw that 58% of the companies mm -hmm. say they are actually running Kubernetes in production. So it's not just a toy. More than the half of the companies are using it in production right now. Exactly. Okay, so not just a hype right now, but uh, there was quite, a, let's say, a discussion. Maybe not a battle, be because uh, there was uh, Mesos, Marathon, a lot of orchestrators uh, for containers during the past few years. Now it's Kubernetes, Kubernetes yes. with other stuff. The, the, the war is over and Kubernetes won the battle, basically. It's uh, settled? Yes, 83% of uh, companies that orchestrate containers do so with Kubernetes. Okay. So all cloud providers, including OVH, now provide a, a managed Kubernetes solution. And all the IT software company within the infrastructure yeah. field will, uh, would uh, rebuild their software using Kubernetes or expose a Kubernetes compatibility. Okay, so right now it's Kubernetes. Yes. When I started at OVH, I started as a sysadmin. Mm -hmm. And uh, what can Kubernetes bring uh, to uh, these IT people? A lot of our customers actually were in the same position or are in the same position now. Do the sysadmin uh, jobs? Yes. Okay. And uh, actually, a way to see that is that Kubernetes generalizes uh, a promise that uh, you would have from the containers, mm -hmm. which is write your software once and you will deploy it everywhere, it will behave the same way. Uh, Kubernetes does exactly the same thing, but at the global enterprise software stack level. So it means that you describe all your software and Kubernetes will uh, operate it in the very same way at one cloud provider, another one, or on the developer laptop, for example. And you can do that because you have the uh, CNCF stamp on the exactly. platforms. That's called the software conformance. Yeah. Uh, once you pass this test, and, and we did, uh, you know that it will exactly uh, behave the same way as any other uh, conform uh, Kubernetes. And that's great to know that the same software will behave the same way on different places, locations. And exactly. Places. So reversibility, the fact that it yeah. uh, behaves everywhere the same way is important, but it also uh, helps you uh, achieve some uh, key things that have always been important, such as auto-healing and auto-scaling. Are uh, auto-scaling and auto-healing really a thing right now? Because there was a promise for a long, long time and uh, it's accessible in production right now with Kubernetes. Yes, so provided that your software has been designed in a cloud-native yeah. way, so it can be basically uh, deployed horizontally. So for example, a website or an API. Mm -hmm. Yes, it simply works because all the job of Kubernetes is making sure that your containers are running in an efficient way on a given piece of compute and storage. What okay. you would do typically is give him a bit more compute and a bit more storage that is actually needed so that it will observe in real time what your containers are doing. And if one is behaving in a bad way, because for example, a compute node is broken, okay. it will just redeploy it on another LC node. Okay, so he used health checks to be sure that the platform is okay. If it's not, he spawns uh, exactly. new containers elsewhere. And it will do exactly the same way if you define uh, performance health checks, for example, the uh, loading time of the home page of your website, for okay. example. And uh, if it's below a given threshold, it will uh, respawn containers on new nodes, so a new copy of your website to make sure that it handles the traffic for a given hour. Or okay, so. If needed, the numbers of containers will grow uh, exactly. with the visitors on my website. You can define boundaries and stuff. Everything is programmatic. You just describe that in a YAML file, in a text file, and Kubernetes will make sure it's, it's always respected. Okay, so th that is for the, the point of view from a sysadmin. And uh, I know that uh, Kubernetes is targeted towards uh, developers first. Um, they are the main uh, targets on this technology? Yes, the, the, the cloud native technologies in general and Kubernetes in particular are really built for and by developers. Okay. Um, so there is not only Kubernetes, but also a whole ecosystem around it. 
um, that will uh, make uh, things simpler in terms of uh, software development, software deployment, uh, continuous integration, CI/CD, etc. Um, for example, uh, with Kubernetes, you will be able really easily to do uh, blue-green deployment. So making sure that when you develop a new version of your software, uh, it's, it's deployed sorry, in a very efficient way and in a transparent way to your customers. And I suppose that uh, it's something appreciated by the boss of yes, these dev teams definitely. to have uh, people more efficient in so their So it will job. decrease the, um, the less interesting jobs that was done by some sysadmin, like respawning software that uh, mm -hmm. became slow or did not respond anymore. It will make the uh, software developers uh, more efficient and help them iterate faster. But you can go uh, a step further with things like service meshes and do uh, something like A-B testing for your marketing or product teams uh, really easily. So it's helpful for uh, a lot of categories of people inside the Within IT. the company, yes. Speaking about that, do you have any advices on especially how to start with Kubernetes? Because it's quite a big project with a lot of aspects and ecosystem. Where, where should I start? We've discussed with a few dozens of customers that have moved to Kubernetes. Okay. And the, the most successful path that we see is like a, a three-step one. The first step would be, most of the time, to actually use Kubernetes to deploy developer tools. It's really good to start there for two reasons, basically. The first one is that it's not production workload. Mm -hmm. So as you are still learning uh, the advantages, but also the way to use Kubernetes, it's better to do that without the production hazard, I would say. And it's new tools. Exactly. It's the same it's as to learn. It will take a few weeks, uh, usually. And the second point is that if you start with uh, your tools, then the next steps will be a lot faster, a lot more efficient. On every step, you gain time. For exactly. The next step. For example, the second step uh, would be to build the tooling around Kubernetes in a production uh, stage. Okay. So basically, mostly around observability, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that you see how the software is behaving and you react uh, in a good way uh, to the different changes that can happen in production. And you do uh, that on a, on a small project, probably? Yes. Usually, what I uh, would advise you is to use a, a real production one, but uh, yeah. without scaling issues. For example, the corporate blog of your company is a good candidate. For that, you just lift and shift the software mm -hmm. from two or three VMs to two yeah. or three containers. Virtual machines to containers. And exactly. you plug the tools you developed or used uh, before. And um, after a couple of months, when you know you're confident, you, you've got the good tooling, you see how it behaves, then you can move to the third and the last step, yeah. which is actually building new software and potentially moving legacy ones to Kubernetes. Okay, and uh, as we uh, discussed before, now new software, it's mostly Kubernetes. Yes, the globally the approach that we see, uh, again from our customer, is that any new software should be by default on Kubernetes. Okay. There are some exceptions, but most of them are now uh, able to, to run in a containerized environment if you design yeah. uh, from the start uh, with this in, in mind. Concerning the legacy software, I've got a very pragmatic approach, which is leave it where it works well and only switch to Kubernetes, the ones that will benefit the most yeah. from the advantages of Kubernetes. Something which needs uh, horizontal scaling. Exactly. Globally, web applications, mm -hmm. APIs, yeah. this kind of software. If I understand well, an IT people should do these three steps while taking care of the Kubernetes clusters, mm -hmm. the nodes, the storage and everything. That seems like a big deal. We do deal. that for you, actually. OK. Uh, OVH, okay. as a cloud provider, is offering a managed Kubernetes service, uh, which is built on top on our, our uh, public cloud. So basically, we provide that totally for free. You only pay for the compute and the storage that will host your containers. We deploy it, we host it, but we also uh, make sure that security updates are applied mm -hmm. uh, in a transparent way. Uh, we can even uh, give you the possibility to move from one Kubernetes version to another in a few clicks. That seems great. And uh, especially if uh, I don't have to take care of that part, it helps me to focus my time on my real job yes. developing. And you will benefit from all the advantages of the public cloud mm -hmm. in terms of uh, performance per price ratio, in terms of uh, predictability of the billing. You know that at OVH, we don't charge for the uh, egress traffic, for example. You, you benefit from the best, of the, the best of the public cloud and the added value of Kubernetes. That sounds perfect. I will finish my coffee and uh, 
try to find a new project to start with uh, Kubernetes. It was a pleasure. Thank you for the few minutes and see you next time. See you.